in, the, in this last lecture, things will be a little bit more sort of opinionated. The, certainly no new material. I just want to touch on some points we've done and uh, pontificate a little bit about various things. So, um, so recall that the main premise of these uh, lectures and all of sort of the main thing that underlies this whole development of direct solvers is really that the solution operators of elliptic PDEs are very benign mathematical objects. So, uh, for instance, we looked at the solution operator of the free space Laplace equation. It's, uh, you know, the, for a few of them, we have analytic representations of it. And that's, you know, it's not that, th they are very useful for numerical work, but for our purposes here, they're also very nice in that they illustrate various properties of these operators that tend, a lot of them are preserved for more general equations. So for instance, for this uh, free space solution operator, we showed how we could split it in a near field and a far field. What we did was basically that we, so it's the exact solution operator is convolution with the kernel, the log singularity. If you want to, you could just locally sandpaper that singularity a little bit. And the point being that then you end up with one part that map, that's, it's an extremely smooth operator. So it maps, and this is the global interaction. So all long t distance interactions are very, very smooth. And uh, this you should, really should exploit in designing algorithms because these operators are global. This is the main drawback of doing things this way. All operators are global. You get dense matrices when you discretize. And this you really have to take into account algorithmically somehow. And of course, this is also the main bottleneck in designing elliptic solvers on parallel machines that you know, you have a, a vast number of points and you can't just scatter them out to all the different machines, but they really have to talk to each other. And uh, however, however you want to solve the equations, you have to deal with it one way or another. So if you discretize the PD directly, then you get a local operator. So that one is very easy to locally store and apply, but then you need iterative solvers. And if you want to get any hope of efficiency here, you sort of need to exploit some some multi-scale information about the problem, that you have to represent it on a hierarchy of different meshes, really, and communicate stuff on the right length scale. So even if you start with a, with a local operator, it's, you still have to use some of this stuff. We're using it much more explicitly. And, uh, and then the other point here is that the, the near field operators, so the singularity is important. So you have to take, into, take this into account somehow. But these are local things. And this is really the type of operators for which hardware is going in a very nice direction. That flops are getting cheap, you know, local storage is not so expensive. All this stuff really militates sort of in favor of this, uh, this approach. And uh, notice that this split applies to a large number of things. Here's a, an analytic solution operator. The same thing, I'm arguing sort of loosely applies to these uh, numerically constructed solution operators. And it also applies to construction of quadrature, for instance. So when we looked at these high order accurate Nyström discretizations, you had exactly the same sort of split, where the long distance interactions are governed by fairly simple rules. And then you had some close range interactions that, that are much more complicated to compute, but, it, but it's entirely local. So those computations, during the constructing the modified elements associated with points being close to each other so that the kernel is almost singular. It's a purely local computation, which means it parallelizes trivially and, you know, you could run it on a GPU or there's a variety of tricks you can do to accelerate that part. All right, so then uh, another thing, so my point here is, is sort of to try to reinforce a few things that I want you to remember ideally after this week. And one of the things is that all these direct solvers, they really follow the same algorithmic pattern. So this is a cartoon, we've seen it before, but just to, to reinforce. So the idea is that we start with some sort of discretization of the domain. So if it's a volume problem, then this is the entire computational domain. It could be that you use a boundary integral equation. Then of course, what I'm what this cartoon is depicting is, is the surface you're integrating on. But in any case, you have some sort of collection of points, and then the idea is to split it into small boxes. So you split it into boxes that are small enough 
the dense computations are cheap. So certainly not hundreds of thousands of nodes or anything in every leaf. Hundreds or thousands is really the size you want to go for. And then what we do is we take each leaf and by a local computation, a purely local computation, we identify some subset of the nodes that don't really interact with the outside world. And uh, in these talks, all methods I've described are some variation of collocation methods, really, where you know, the unknowns are represented by collocations of the various functions involved. Conceptually, everything should work. We haven't really tried this, but you know, it's, it, this is not really a necessary requirement. It simplifies things. But you certainly could have expansions in local basis functions in here. And many times, if you have expansions in local basis functions, in order to get a picture like this, it, it's just a little transform. Because for any set of basis functions, you could always, in principle, even if you don't do it explicitly, you could, in principle, identify a set of good collocation points for them. But so anyhow, so we, we identify some degrees of freedom that don't talk to the outside world. So if we start with something like a finite difference or a finite element discretization of the PDE, then this is very immediate, that the connection between the red points and anything outside the box is zero. The corresponds to zeros in the coefficient matrix. So it's a very direct statement. In that case, when we talk about integral equations, it's a little bit more subtle, because then every element of the coefficient matrix is non-zero. So what we're relying on here is that there's a finite rank of interaction between any one of the leaves and the outside world. Okay. So once we know that there's a finite interaction, how do we identify points? Well, this is done by skeletonization, specifically, typically executed via Gram-Schmidt, or Gram-Schmidt accelerated by this randomized sampling technique. So that's really what we're doing in practice in this step. And the point of that is to eliminate the interior nodes. And then the overall flow of the algorithm is that now we've done processing of the leaves. There's a single upwards pass through the tree where I take the leaves and I merge them by pairs. And then some nodes that used to be exterior nodes are now interior nodes. And you eliminate them. And just continue up the tree like this, until you get to the top. If the problem size is reasonable, you then just invert by brute force, and, uh, and then you do a downwards pass for the solve. If the problems are very large, if you start to get a large number of points at the higher levels, you might need to introduce a secondary hierarchy where you represent the operators living on the surviving points using some sort of structured matrix format. So this is the overall picture. And uh, we've seen several instantiations of this general idea. So uh, we looked at, so we started by looking at uh, things that spring out of nested dissection algorithms, the multifrontal methods. We start with a large sparse system, and there's this classical idea of ordering the nodes in such a way that you reduce, you sort of, you cut the system in half. You have a large grid, you cut out a string of nodes, and then that the grid splits in two halves. You invert each half separately, or compute an LU factorization, and then you need to glue them together by doing some operations on what's called, in that context, the frontal matrix that lives along these nodes. Okay, so that was one, that's one meaning of the term solution operator that I'm using here. And then, of course, in the nested dissection, you go down hierarchically. So then to process each half, you do the same thing and proceed down. And, uh, and this works very nicely. One disadvantage of uh, this procedure is that if you want to do high-order computations, then typically the size of the stencil widens. So any single node in the grid talks to more than his immediate neighbors, basically. There's a bigger range of influence for each guy. And that tends to really increase, as we saw in this slide Adriano showed, about how nested dissection has in 2D complexity n to the 1.5, but the prefactor really depends on the size of the stencil. It depends strongly and badly 
So this was the main motivation for developing this uh, hierarchical poincaria Steklov scheme, where uh, the, the idea was to, uh, to really try to do the same thing that we're doing in as the dissection for numerical Dirichlet to Neumann operators, so these sure complements or frontal matrices, we refer to them in many different ways. They're really some sort of Dirichlet to Neumann operators on the grid. Then here, the idea was to do the same thing first for mathematical operators, conceptually think about merging of Dirichlet to Neumann maps, say, or impedance to impedance maps, or whichever operator is the most suited to your application. Um, to first think about doing this mathematically, and then downsample sort of specifying some band, you know, some band limit the problem or some such, restricting this to, uh, to functions that can be represented nicely on the interfaces using some finite basis. Uh, we typically use polynomial basis tabulated at, say, Gauss-Legendre nodes along the boundaries. And, uh, and then you can get an efficient scheme. So the idea here, the main point here is that the, the interfaces are very thin. So these are high order schemes that the width of the interface does not grow. Uh, and another thing that's nice here is that recall that we use these spectral computations locally. And uh, you know, using global spectral methods to solve PDEs, it has certain issues with conditioning as the problems get very large. But here, we're really only doing that on reasonably sized patches. So we pay a slight price. I think we can avoid even paying that price, but that's work in progress. And then we talk, OK, so in this case, the solution operator is some sort of high, some sort of Poincaré Steklov operator, Dirichlet to Neumann operator. I've many times had the thought that it would probably be better to work with the Neumann to Dirichlet operator, because that's a smoothing operator. Uh, you can do uh, impedance to impedance. There's a variety of different things. But these are all compressible. And, uh, and then we have um, the next, what we did in the last couple of days was talking about dense matrices arising from integral equation formulations. So in that case, the solution operators, you should think of as being these numerical scattering matrices. So you have some patch of the surface. Say you have a boundary integral equation on the surface. You have a patch of the surface. There's an incoming wave that's caused both by the outside field and by sources on the other points in the mesh. So these, both of these sources create an incoming field. And then you create this local, the numerical scattering matrix that maps the incoming field to a set of sources on the patch that locally equilibrate the equation. And then the main observation is that you don't need to do, you could do this for the full, the, the inverse of the full diagonal block is a scattering matrix. But you don't need to form that whole thing. You can have a compressed representation of it. So the size here is really only dependent on the rank of interaction between the patch and the outside wall. Right. So all these things blur information over distance. So what do I mean when I say that? So here I. I wanted to deliberately draw something a little sloppy just to capture, capture the, the key features. We've, we've seen this graph right now. So I've, this is very deliberate. You might have found it repetitive, but it, I'm trying to make a point here that you're seeing the same pattern in all of these different applications. So all these different instantiations of solution operators coming from different types of numerical modeling, we typically see this exponential decay of the singular values for interactions between pieces that are separated. This is not for self-interaction, of course. But if you take two separate pieces of the domain, domain on which you, do, you run the direct solver, then for things like Laplace, elasticity, Stokes, you have rapid exponential decay of the singular values. And uh, basically the same ideas, they carry over to Helmholtz, to time harmonic Maxwell, and so on. But here, there's this additional complication that you don't have any decay until you fully resolve the wavelength, which puts a, a pretty firm upper limit on what you can do with rank considerations only. If the wavelength is very small compared to the computational domain, then this is probably not the ideal solution technique. But, uh, 
But anything finer than the wavelength, you just compress out. All right, so notice here that there's a, there's a big research opportunity because th this is not, th there are very few theorems. So we, all these things, we, we have a fairly good idea. There's a good heuristics that tell you what these curves look like. And the, but these heuristics are based on looking at things like the potential evaluation map for a free space problem. So in that case, the slope here, so if you do Laplace, the slope here is really determined by the rate of convergence of a multipole expansion. For Helmholtz, it's exactly the same thing. So this is, it's very carefully analyzed, both where is this knee, and then what's the rate of decay. But in that case, it's expansions of Bessel functions that you're looking at. But so, so we know these things. For the free space case, it's very carefully analyzed. We observed that that general pattern carries over to a pretty broad range of situations. Uh, if you have variable coefficient problems, you know there's very little analysis to support this. But there are lots of empirical observations to show that you know, once you compress things numerically, it just works very nicely. So notice here that we base algorithms on heuristics. So now you have to be a little bit careful. So there are good and bad ways of using heuristics. So something that would be very dangerous here, what you don't want to do is do some back of the envelope calculation saying, oh, my ranks are probably less than 250. So now I'm going to set the rank to 250 and just run the scheme. In that case, you may end up getting very good accuracy, but you could also die horribly because your heuristics may not be valid in some region. So instead, what you want to do is that you want to, you want to adaptively determine the ranks at every case, in every situation. Using the heuristics is good for an initial guess. Sometimes you can accelerate the computation if you have some idea of what the rank is. But make sure that you don't, the accuracy of your code should not hinge on your initial guess. It's performance will. If you have a good initial guess, then you, know, you will get better performance. And if you're in some situations where you thought you ha would have good decay, and in fact the decay is quite slow, then you, s you want to design the algorithm so that it, it will still run and execute and give you, but it should give you an accurate answer. It will just take longer. And you probably want to have some little warning so that the user knows what's happening when computation that you thought would take a minute takes half an hour. There should be some little warning that, oh, things are not going as expected here. Right. So this is something you have to be a little careful with. But if you are careful, it's really, what, I, what I'm saying here is not that you should just skate on thin ice and, you know, risk any major danger. You can, you can protect yourself. Um, and uh, so another thing we talked about, so this we talked about just this morning, perhaps we don't need to go over it again, but just that these local solution operators, they're a very efficient way of encoding a variety of internal dynamics of patches. And it's a very generic tool that a broad range of phenomena that are modeled by elliptic PDs, you can use this technique for. So we talked about corners, that's one particularly appealing application. Another thing you can do is, uh, so something that I've been meaning to do many times, and uh, we published just a brief note outlining the idea because I realized I wouldn't have time to work on it for a while. Um, but I, I think that these things will, they will be excellent tools for doing numerical coarse graining, for uh, modeling with, for modeling, I mean, initially two scale materials like something like this, you have a composite material. And then the question is, how do you devise numerical methods? And you, when you think about it, it, it's exactly the type of situation we're talking about now. So if you have this type of two-scale method, so think of a composite material. So you have a composite material with some sort of overall shape. So say it's an airplane wing or something. And then there's a microstructure. So when you numerically model this, you see that the, the, the question is, do you need to resolve the microstructure? In many cases, it's completely impossible. You know, there are way too many inclusions. You cannot resolve them. And in that case, the question is what you do. So does a 
mathematical theory here that's called homogenization. You can sort of average the microstructures so that you find some equivalent properties for a constant coefficient PD or a coefficient with slowly varying coefficients, uh, a PD with slowly varying coefficients. And, uh, and this really only works in very simple situations because everything tends to break down if you have boundaries. It's, th these are a little prickly to work with. And, and this is well known, of course. So people have designed alternatives. You can use uh, finite element computations. So you can, if you take a grid, um, if you take a problem like this, you can put a coarse finite element grid on it. And then just internally inside each element, you locally compute basis functions that incorporates the information of the microstructure. So then you sort of reduce these fine scales. So that's sort of the same idea as what we're using in a lot of these direct solvers, that you're doing a local computation to compress out the local information. But, uh, but in my view, this is not really an ideal way of doing it, because you're still implicitly constructing some sort of PD or a difference equation, perhaps, to model the system. But why not just try to construct a solution operator directly? It's a, it's a much more nicely behaved object. So I, I think you can do exactly the same idea of local compression, but you can use the direct solver methodology. And here, of course, there are a couple of different environments. So the environment where I think this would be the most compelling are things that are, that are really inaccessible to current strategies. So things like wave propagation through a composite material. It, it's very hard to use homogenization or these multi-scale finite elements and so on. And in this case, you basically need to resolve the microstructure if you want to get serious information. And I, I think this, the techniques we've described here provides a path for doing that. And then, of course, the more benign situations, if you're looking at elasticity with some material with little inclusions in it. In that case, homogenization works very well, but uh, this technique should work at least as well. So in that ca case, what you can do is you can do some sort of statistical methods. You can compute the solution operators for a representative collection of patches and you know, find some average solution operators. They just, if you read the mathematical theory in homogenization, the, the difficulty is really that they're implicitly trying to approximate, to construct a PD whose inverse operator resembles the original PD. But this to me is unnecessarily hard because you have the original PD that has its exact solution operator. Why not try to approximate the solution operator directly? So to illustrate the so things that I've been looking at is if you have some sort of composite material, you have a crack propagating through. Of course, this is not a real model. You see this crack. It's just, it's just a line that's drawn on top. Uh, so this is very, you know, this is just things I'm sketching. But my idea is that if you have this sort of multi-scale collection, you have this hierarchy of solution operators, that in any part that's not touched by the crack as it propagates, you can just use your pre-computed solution operator and get a reduced model. And then as this thing propagates through, you, know, you just need to change the tessellation a little bit. All right, so we talked about this one. Uh, let's skip that, we just did it. And uh, now here's, here's a pretty important point. So I mentioned this briefly earlier in the week, that there's no need to take a militant view of direct solvers. But Use them when they work well. If they don't work for you and iterative solvers converge reasonably fast, then you know, use that when appropriate. So notice that in these direct solvers, that the computations on the local levels is perfectly linear. The ranks are always small. They're necessarily small. So in particular, if it's a wave problem, anything sub-wavelength, you know, the ranks do not really grow. Um, so what you can do is uh, you can run the direct solver on the finer levels. And especially if you have complications, like you have domains with corners, you have like the microstructure belongs to this category. So run the direct solver on the finer levels. But then if you notice that oh, things start to slow down, you, know, you start to get aggregation of ranks, it's starting to get unpleasant, you're starting to run out of memory maybe, because <coughs> these things are more memory intense. 
then what you can do is that at any point where you get sick of the direct solver, you can just flip to an iterative one. Because on, on every level, we still have a matrix. And the off-diagonal blocks of this matrix are exactly the same as the original matrix. So if we're working with an integral equation, you can use the FMM. Like when the direct solver starts to get expensive, you can switch to an FMM to do all long distance interactions. Quick comment. Yeah. It sounds very much like components with domain composition and having, you know, I think that when you start doing sort of iteration at the root of the tree, you need to start thinking about the overlap of your niche condition, all the sort of classic results that you have in the convergence of domain composition. It might not be as uh, rapidly converging if you're just, you sort of, if you stop the hierarchical point card, it's that at some level and start domain composition iterating from there, that might not work because you haven't done an overlap condition, for instance. Right, so, so with a Poincaré stack law scheme, I, I have not tried this at all. So I, I had more in mind compression of integral equations, because that's really where we're seeing the problems of the increase in rank. Like it's when, when we run the direct solvers, it's currently for 3D surfaces, we can do a few million degrees of freedom. But people who run iterative solvers can do much more. Uh, and in that case, we haven't run anything super large, but I really cannot think of any reason why the convergence of the compressed equations should not be at least as good as you know, what you would find. And actually, in many cases, even better, that if you have these local resonances where you have corners, there are a number of reasons why things like that can mess with convergence of an iterative method. So when you discretize a corner, for instance, you can introduce a number of eigenmodes to the matrix that don't really have much physical meaning. It, it's some sort of numerical artifact of what you did to the corner. So things like that can really slow down GMRAS. So my sense is that it's very rare that doing direct solvers on the final levels would harm you in terms of iteration count. I know many examples where it greatly helps you. But the Poincaré Steckler scheme, I won't say anything about. I really have no idea. So can we drill down on that for a minute? If I do a large scale heterogeneous seismic model, mm -hmm. I make it a 3D rectangle. Yeah. I don't have to have a 3D rectangle. I like to have a 3D ellipsoid. Uh -huh. And I've gotten rid of it. My eye construction is going to be better? Or is there a construction if I did that? Um. I just have to have a volume that encompasses where the reflection right, is taking so place in the model with the heterogeneity, I don't have to have a cube. Right, but so in this case, your corner is not physical. So presumably your solution, it, so it, I mean, it depends on what boundary conditions you have. So if you solve, so. I'm going to have the, what they now call PML. Or the right, so in that case, you won't have singularities. So th th this is benign. Okay. The things. Uh, I'll come to a slide later. Okay. So the, the issue, when I'm talking about corners, is that if you're solving a, a boundary integral equation or if you're solving a PDE on a domain with corners, then in many cases the solutions develop singularities. They're much less smooth near the corner than they are in the rest of the domain. We have to resolve this somehow, and that can... But that's better to have an yeah, so I mean, it's the same thing if you, I mean, there's a famous, and the famous example is the L-shaped domain. I mean, this is, textbooks and finite elements all talk about, you have some singularity here, the question is how do you resolve it? And there's a number of issues related to discretization, but then even once you've done that, it oftentimes harms you in uh, convergence of the iteration. Another thing we talked about is uh, using randomized sampling to accelerate matrix computations. And what we talked about was uh, the case where you have a matrix A. So notice I should, I should perhaps have used a different letter here. So in these talks, the matrix that you're compressing here is always an off-diagonal block of the coefficient matrix. So for these off-diagonal blocks, they have rapidly decaying singular values. And we talked about randomized compression schemes for accelerating that computation. 
So a few quick points just to recap. Notice that these guys, they interact, they behave, they share a property with Krylov methods in that they interact with the matrix only via matrix vector multiply, or even better, matrix matrix multiply. Typically, we need access to both A and its transpose. But, uh, but th this, in this context, this really can simplify matters for you. So sometimes you have these expressions for scattering matrices. That's a chain of operators. And you know that the entire chain is low rank. But it might be that it's very complicated to evaluate all these steps. Well, the randomized sampling actually lets you sidestep that. If you, if you can use an iterative method, say, to solve the local sort of scattering problem, there's a number of ways in which this can simplify life for you. Or if you have a, an F, a, a, you might have a legacy FMM code that allows you to do, evaluate certain uh, long-range interactions. This will help. This can all be used to accelerate computing these low-rank decompositions. And then one environment that's really extreme. Th this is the main workhorse. This is something we use a lot. Is acceleration from M and K. For you. The, the problem of you given just a modest size matrix, a few thousand rows and columns, you want to find a low rank decomposition. And in particular, if you want to do an interpolative decomposition. Because in this case, we use this uh, accelerated sampling scheme to find a sampling, so a sequence of vectors that span, say, the column space or the matrix. And then you can run the ID on just those samples to find the indices. So it's, it's a particularly nice combination that if you want the interpolative decomposition, then using the randomized sampling scheme is, is particularly appealing. Notice also in that case, you never compute. You don't need to apply the transpose for that situation. All you need to do is you need to find the indices that point to the skeleton rows, and then you extract those. So that's reasonably cheap. Oh. Right. So something we have not talked about uh, is that there also exists, uh, so th this is something that's very dear to my heart. I, I, this is something I'm working on right now. And it's uh, randomized sampling of rank structured matrices. So I, I've gone to great pains to emphasize that when I talk about randomized sampling, then A here is an off-diagonal block of the coefficient matrix. That's not the entire story. You can actually do this also for rank structured matrices. So you can take the entire coefficient matrix or some suitable subpart of the coefficient matrix and use randomized sampling to compute this HBS representation of it or an S matrix representation of it. And uh, it takes more samples. So instead of uh, just K samples, you typically need something like K times log M samples. But uh, it can still, it, it's rare that this method is faster than using uh, sort of the analysis-based compression, but it's much easier to code. It's, you, you can black box these computations. So as long as you have a matrix vector multiply, you can then compute the HPS representation of the matrix. So it can really save you coding work. And uh, you know something that gets very expensive in these codes are things like any algorithm that needs a matrix matrix multiply. Multiplying together two HBS matrices is in principle not hard, but actually executing it turns out to be a fairly costly step. So now if we have this type of randomized sampling scheme where all you need, the only way you need to access the matrix A is via its application to vectors, then of course if you have B and C compressed already, then this is a trivial matter. So the point here is not so much to accelerate things, but really to simplify the coding, which would be very valuable. Like coding these double hierarchies is, is, is a major bottleneck to progress in this field. All right, so error analysis. So notice that a lot of the methods here we've discussed, they have a slightly different flavor than classical numerical methods for solving elliptic PDs. So for many of them, you know, they're based on some underlying, oftentimes there's a classical discretization underlying. So sometimes you know, we, we do start with a finite element discretization, or we start with a local spectral discretization, or we start with a underlying quadrature rule. We might use 10 points 
Gauss Legendre quadrature, so we have some underlying order 19 or something. But th this is usually just to derive the system. And after that, everything is fixed precision. So you, you set the tolerance, and then you do computations to that precision. And, uh, and this is a little bit different even than uh, these analytic expansions, um, like in the first multiple method. So you have to be a little bit careful here, because the local truncation errors, so what's, what's easy to specify is the local truncation error. But they do aggregate a little bit. So you have to think about this. I, this is something I didn't want to talk about, because it gets very technical. But, uh, and generally, at least when I'm developing the methods, I sort of do it just based on heuristics. I want overall, I want the output to have accuracy 10 to the minus 8. Then maybe I need to set the local truncation error to 10 to the minus 10. This is typically what we're talking about. But it's something you need to pay a little bit of attention to. It turns out to be fairly hard to uh, numerically bound the errors. In some situations, if the underlying matrix is symmetric positive definite or something, you can do this and you know, show that there's only additive aggregation of errors as you go through the levels or something. In general, it's a little bit hard. So since we have a fairly, since we don't have a very ironclad error analysis for this, it's important to incorporate error checks. This is something I must sound like a broken record, but th this is really important. But what's nice is that when you have these, so for the direct methods, you, you can oftentimes evaluate the error very, very accurately. So say you have So if we're given a coefficient matrix A, so typically what we're doing, at least implicitly, <coughs> is we have some compressed representation of it. So to some tolerance epsilon, we approximate it. And it's oftentimes easy to show that, that this is small. This analysis is not so hard. So then what's difficult is how does a inverse Right, what does that look like? This is much harder, because notice that we truncate stuff, that the inversion process is not exact. We do truncate, we compute things. We rely on uh, physical heuristics. Oh, this operator should have rapidly singular decaying singular values. We compute them, then we truncate. So it, it's really quite hard to, uh, to provide a priori bar error bounds on these things. But notice that it's really quite simple to compute them, because I have a, OK, so I don't have access to this. But I have access to, uh, to I can rapidly apply A. I can rapidly apply A inverse, A epsilon inverse. I can apply the transpose. And uh, you know, maybe you can do things like you can compute All right, so usually computing just the approximation to A is very cheap. So you can do things like this. That's not really an ironclad proof that you don't have errors, but you can do lots of things to reassure yourself that you're not incurring any unnecessary errors. All right, and now this, is, this slide is probably the most important slide today. So notice that I've many times today, uh, many times in this week, I've talked about how things deteriorate a little bit with dimension. And in higher dimensions, you get larger skeletons, complexity deteriorates. But so what I don't want you to do is misremember this as me saying that you shouldn't use direct solvers in 3D. So you have to be very careful about what's the dimensionality of the domain on which you apply the direct solver. So in 1D, the direct solver, when it acts on a 1D domain, it's extremely fast. I mean, we can get. I, we can easily compete with things like the fast multiple method. I mean, certain for application of the inverse, it is essentially FFT speed. It's, it's very, very fast. In two dimensions, just plain things like if you just use the HBS representation out of the box, it usually works fine as long as the problem is not very large. If it's very large, it's not that hard to accelerate to get linear complexity. 
3D is a little iffy. But this, this direction is the dimensionality of the domain on which you apply the direct solver. So these extremely high efficiency direct solvers, they apply to a lot of 2D problems. So for instance, boundary integer equations defined on curves in 2D. Um, if you do nested dissection along with the finite element discretization, for the scheme we devised, the poincare steklov scheme, this is all in the extremely high efficiency column. All right. So for two dimensions, so these are things where you know, we're right now starting to get competitive codes. Um, so these are boundary integer equations on surfaces in 3D. And it's variable coefficient problems as long as you do this nested dissection type technique. So the point here is not that direct solvers are not useful in three dimensions, it's that if you want to use direct solvers, you should, if at all possible, combine them with some sort of dimensionality reduction technique. So rewriting things as an integral equation is extremely attractive in this environment because we're going to be working with dense matrices anyway. So the upfront penalty you're paying for an integral equation method is much lower. If uh, you have a variable coefficient problem, then definitely start by exploiting, you know, in that case, discretizing using, you know, by discretizing the PD directly is a good way, but uh, then use some sort of multifrontal nested dissection type method where you exploit zeros in the off diagonal blocks to get down one dimension and then apply the direct solve. Thanks, one question. What about other, other ordering schemes, such as Morton order or a black and white, a red and black, instead of nested dissection? I really have no, nothing useful to say about direct solvers for that. But we, we, we can think about it. We, we can chat about it this afternoon. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's not something that has previously struck me as a useful way of using direct solvers, but I may well have overlooked something. But uh, the nested dissection type methods certainly immediately look like something. It looks like something that's amenable to direct solvers, and it certainly is. I mean, linear complexity direct solvers, I should say. They are direct solvers. All right, any other questions about this? All right, let's just quickly go over some numerical examples. So you notice that these lectures have been very, very light on numerical examples, and that's on purpose because this stuff gets dated quickly. But um, just to touch on some examples. So Adriana only had an hour, I had 10, so I'll use <laughs> some of this time to talk a little bit more about the poincaria steklov scheme. So uh, something that I, I wanted to uh, mention is first of all that when you, when you can use these spectral high-order local discretizations, something that's very nice is that you, you can now deal with a number of things that have been considered very hard previously. So for instance, discretization of problems with oscillatory solutions. If you use finite difference methods, so we've talked a lot about a fixed number of points per wavelength, as if you know, this is a matter of course. Of course, you discretize with you know, 10 points per wavelength or 20 points per wavelength. But notice that you know, the vast majority of these computations are done with finite difference methods, and they, they don't work that way. If you put 10 points per wavelength, and then you start looking at bigger and bigger problems, you're quickly going to lose all accuracy. So as the problem size increases, you're going to need more points per wavelength, like substantially more. And also the number 10 is probably way too low. You, we are talking for low order methods, something like 50 points per wavelength to get decent accuracy. So in contrast, so one thing I really wanted to emphasize about this poincare steklov scheme, for instance, so here we run it with 12 points per wavelength. And here, this is a slightly artificial example, but I wanted to do it on a constant coefficient problem. Of course, you should use the boundary integer equation formulation for this, but, uh, but just to compare it against something where we know an exact solution. But as you go from a domain that's seven by seven wavelengths to 200 by 200 wavelengths, it's a mild decay of the errors. You lose accuracy a little bit, 
But we get essentially nine or 10 digits, even for a domain that's 200 by 200 wavelength. And this computation is done on a laptop. So it, it's really, these schemes are really very efficient. It takes about uh, 10 minutes on a, this is a, well, not even a very powerful laptop. Solve time here is, uh, it scales perfectly linearly. Um, and uh, the biggest one turns out to be 21 seconds, but that's because we ran out of memory. If you extrapolate, it would be one second. So one second to do a nine digits accurate solve on a domain that's 200 by 200 wavelengths. Just to illustrate, so the main, the main thing here is the power of high order methods. And then, you know, the direct solver is this icing on top. Um, what else did I want to say? I guess Adriana talked about all this. All right, so here's another interesting point. So in these schemes, we can certainly do mesh refinement. So this is a classical model problem, as I mentioned in finite element analysis. What do you do with a corner? And uh, this, uh, the poincare Steklov scheme can certainly do the same thing. The only additional issue here is that you need to retire. You need some sort of interpolations between different grids. Because if you put gauss legendre nodes on this box, that does not perfectly match up with the gauss legendre nodes. So it doesn't match up at all of the nodes of the children box. So you need to be a little bit careful in how you do these interpolations, but it all works out. Now, one reason I particularly wanted to bring up this slide is that this, again, is an illustration of where direct solvers are very useful. Because you can use, now we added a lot of extra points near the corner. But we can get rid of them again with a purely local computation. And notice that this is actually a linear complexity computation, even without, even without doing anything fancy. Because the problem size doesn't grow. If you have a locally refined tree, so if you have a domain, and then you have local refinement around some point, So say this is the tree. I guess I should have put in a little more. Right. That's what the tree would look like. Now think about what happens when you run the direct solver. OK, so we compute the little solution operators here. And then we move them up to here. But at any point, the number of degrees of freedom in going from one level to the next is the same. So that there's no rank growth here. So for this kind of thing, it's really ideally suited to a direct solver. And this computation is entirely local. So if you think about a, some situation where you have some vast domain, the problem is stored on some you know, unpleasant, big, parallel, distributed memory machine, this part of the computation is not going to bite at all. You just do everything locally, and then you can start dealing with global interactions at the higher levels. I think we need to skip ahead quite a bit. All right, so let me, I've shown you this picture a couple of times. Let me just give you the numbers. So the computation here that we actually ran, each bowl is about five wavelengths across. What we're doing is we're computing a local scattering matrix for each one of these. And now we're switching to an iterative solver to deal with interbody interactions. So in this case, you spend most of your time. So if you don't compute the local scattering matrices, it doesn't converge at all. Like you, you see zero convergence. If you do compute the local scattering matrices, we get convergence in a couple hundred iterations, I believe. Uh, let's see, yeah, here. Ah, oh, less. So about 60 iterations, you get convergence. So this we did to, if you want five digits, it takes six hours. If you want seven digits, it takes 27 hours. And in this case, you spend most of your time doing the FMM between the bodies. But uh, you, you get a solution. OK, what else? So here is, uh, so the previous domain was a little bit of a cheat because these guys are rotationally symmetric, which really simplifies both discretization and computation of the local scattering matrix. So here's an example where uh, we have a general domain. 
This is a joint work with James Bremer and Adriana Gilman. And uh, so here we have some local ellipsoids. We're doing acoustic scattering on the exterior domain. And we can go up to about a million and a half degrees of freedom here to uh, four digits of accuracy. The computation takes less than an hour. You can get higher accuracy, but then it takes a little bit longer. You need more points. But these are really, this is sort of what we can do at this point. But this field, one reason I didn't really want to show this, or at least show it, not, not make it a big point, is that th these codes are improving very rapidly at this point. So these numbers will be dated quickly. And uh, part of the reason we get high accuracy here is, of course, these powerful quadratures. It's not uh, direct solver so much, but the quadratures. But if you do something like this, this is an even more powerful illustration of these quadratures. So this is the idea of Coleman Roeplin, uh, later refined by uh, Gimbutas and Bremer. So for this sort of very unpleasant domain, uh, again, acoustic scattering, you can get 10 digits of accuracy. And uh, I would have been a slight discontentment here is that it, it, our, our goal was to, so this is classical problem computing the capacitance of a cube, just even for the Laplace problem. Solving the exterior problem to high accuracy is, uh, is, is something that's surprisingly challenging to existing methods. So unfortunately, Johan Helsing, of course, solved that shortly before we ran our experiments. So then we needed to up the ante a little bit, so because Helsing exploited a lot of special things about the cube, that there are flat faces, there are lots of symmetries, things like this. So we didn't. But again, this is not, direct solvers are very helpful in this context, but it's really primarily thanks to the quadratures. All right, so here's very recent work. So we've done uh, a direct solver for lippmann schwinger in the plane. You get linear complexity by using these double hierarchies. And uh, these are the numbers you can handle about 3 million degrees of freedom. It takes about an hour to do the inversion. And now this scales linearly. So as you go to bigger problems, then uh, you know, it will scale well. It is a little bit of a memory hog. This takes 34 gigabytes for 3 million degrees of freedom. But it's, it's a volume problem. All right. Um, let me go back to my other slides. All right, so notice here that these things are a little bit aimed ahead. But the examples we can show at this point, they're, they're more in 3D, in, in 2D, you know, we, we slaughter everything basically, but this is not very helpful because in 2D, Modern computers are powerful enough that you don't need to be very good about solving things. You know, use any method and a very powerful computer, and in 2D you can do a lot. Um, but in 3D, it's a little bit of a different story. And uh, we're, we're just getting to the point that I've been aiming for for many years, when we're starting to get enough storage that you can actually do these things. You can do very high order discretizations, you can run direct solvers, and uh, um, my hope here is that, uh, my expectation is that things will look very nice over the next several years. Because notice that the, these things, so they're, they're memory intense and they're flop intense. But they're very nice in terms of communication. And this is exactly the type of algorithms you want to have at this point. So uh, a little bit, this is almost my last slide. A little bit of a cautionary note in designing PD solvers is that there's Designing PD solvers in 3D is really, it's an enormous amount of work. Processing the geometry is the major bottleneck. People who have good codes for this, it's very hard to compete with them in the short term. So you want to think a little bit about, by the time that my methods are ready to be deployed, what are computers gonna look like? And that's what you wanna aim for. So, uh, so it was very gratifying working on these uh, linear algebra problems because you, there's none of this issue. You know, once you come up with a better algorithm, people just, oh, I want to use that. In PD solvers, you really need to be, you need to be much better than the competition if you want to convince people to, to use your methods. 
Okay, so that was basically it in terms of uh, technical material. Let me just wrap up by again pointing out that this is a group effort. There's a number of people who helped me early on and have continued to help. Large number of collaborators, former and current students, and uh, everything I presented is, of course, joint between all these people. Um, research support. I'm very happy to have been supported by NSF and DORPA, and uh, you know, this is essential, so I'm very grateful to that. Specifically, locally, I have to again thank the organizers. This has been a wonderful opportunity. And uh, yeah, this has, for me, it has really been great. I hope everybody else has had a reasonably good time. So many, many thanks to the organizers and the funders of the conference. And uh, of all these uh, people on the slides, I do have to single out Vladimir and Leslie, who uh, have, uh, you know, Vladimir set me on track for these direct solvers back when I was a postdoc, and uh, they both continue to provide very valuable advice over all these years. So many thanks, and many thanks to the audience, of course, for suffering through 10 hours. <laughs> so many thank you. <laughs>